In 1831, a young Frenchman, Alexis de Tocqueville, came to America on a mission of research. His assignment was to study the penal system of this new nation. But what he discovered had nothing to do with prisons and had everything to do with freedom. He traveled and wrote about his journeys in a book, Democracy in America. His views on democracy, slavery, and politics helped shape the thoughts of politicians, statesmen, and educators ever since. What he saw amazed him. He was a Frenchman. French had been ruled by kings and noblemen. Every citizen took their orders from the top down. All the officials were appointed, and they were usually relatives of the king. In America, he observed, this nation was being built from the bottom up. He said America's greatness started in the townships. The townships made the state, and the state made the nation. People actually elected their own local officials and started commerce and farms everywhere. Alexis didn't make it through Hudson when he wrote his book, but if he had, he would have found the perfect model of a township that makes a state, that makes a nation. Here, out in the western frontier, out in the middle of nowhere, a young man, David Hudson, from Goshen, Connecticut, decided he would build a community where free men could live, prosper, and raise a family. It would be a beacon of light in the wilderness, a place where people were free to worship, start a business, and most importantly, develop education in the frontier. This nation was called the Great Experiment by the rest of the world. The ruling classes of Europe scoffed at the idea that common men could build a nation. Our forefathers believed otherwise, and men like David Hudson were eager to prove good common men could combine religious ethics and morals to build a community that serves itself and its country. This is the story of how Hudson, Ohio became the community it is today, how its citizens from day one built and developed Hudson into a great community, and how Hudson people, then and now, contribute to the greatness that is America. David felt a little restricted by his community, by the religious faith that was occurring, by the social settings of Goshen. He was a young man thirsting for adventure, wanting to be something in his life, and he thought that by founding a town, coming to a town, he would have a little more control over a town. He would amount to something in life. Um, he could develop institutions where uh, religious freedoms could take place that weren't necessarily taking place in Connecticut. David Hudson did set the standard for entrepreneurship. Uh, he was the original free market guy. Uh, he saw the opportunity that this country uh, uh, was uh, uh, was going was offering and he took he took a chance for sure. Moses Cleveland came to this area in 1796. By 1798, the Connecticut Land Company was ready to sell land to investors. My partners, Nathan and Birdsey Norton, along with myself, bought Township 4, Range 10, and we paid about 34 cents per acre. I came with my wife, six children, and 45 friends and relatives. I wanted to create a beacon of light out in the West. I wanted to create a community where good people could raise a family, worship, 
farm or start a business, and build schools to educate our people. When I first came to Hudson, our nation was only around 20 years old. Thomas Jefferson was our president, and he was encouraging people to pioneer out in the West. These are exciting times. We have a nation. We defeated the most powerful nation in the world during the Revolution. The British wanted another England over here. No. No, no kings, no queens. We'll have our own nation, the United States of America. We'll figure it out. I knew many people that died in that war for our freedom. They were just farmers, church-going folk. The Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, our Bill of Rights, free speech, freedom of worship, they mean something to me. They should mean something to all of us. That's why we came to Hudson, because we could. There was a pioneer spirit sweeping America in the early 1800s. Most of our population was in the East, yet we had a vast nation in the West to explore. That spirit made for good business. Land was for sale in the West and Ohio was the West. The Connecticut Land Company was an investment group who surveyed and sold parcels to investors and pioneers like David Hudson. Land was cheap and the opportunities were endless. The only drawbacks were wild Indians and the British and French armies, but that story would come later. And the reason why Connecticut ended up claiming this land was because Connecticut was a landlocked state, and at the end of the Revolutionary War, they did not have any place to expand. And they asked the then federal government about exercising their land claims in the West. Connecticut was in a growth period. They had a little extra money, their industries were doing well, so people from those communities could afford to take a chance and go out and to develop somewhere else and hopefully become prosperous at that. The significance of these transactions are uniquely American. This new land could be bought by anyone with the resources to pay for it. It wasn't a relative of a king, but the common man who could own his own land. This was a big step in nation building. The next big step was for any man, regardless of race, color, or creed, to own his own land. That story will also come later. The difference with David Hudson is that he was the proprietor, that is the owner, the principal owner of this township. And he didn't stay home in Goshen, Connecticut and let an agent sell the land for him. He moved his entire family out here and he persuaded his friends and relatives to also come out here and buy land from him and that was how the settlement of Hudson got started. This explains our New England influence for culture and architecture. To build a community it has to have an attraction. The attraction to Hudson was David Hudson himself and farmable land. In 1799, when David Hudson first acquired the land from the Connecticut Land Company, you know, we were part of the Western Reserve, and he was from Goshen, Connecticut. So he and everyone who came from Goshen brought along with them their New England um, elements of the small town, the village green, the white churches, and, and most notably for Hudson, is the architecture because it's not just that we're a small town with some nice old buildings it's that they have really distinctive architecture and they've been preserved word spread and soon more families artisans and people with needed skills made the move to hudson well you had hatters and sh and people that made shoes and people that knit things and um all of 
the things you needed for life were here. For the first 10 years, David Hudson's dream was becoming a reality. The population of Ohio in 1801 was only 45,000 people. In Hudson, our community had less than 100. The Baldwin brothers put up a store. David Hudson started a post office. We had mail delivery about once a week that came from the county seat in Warren and points east. Even though things were going pretty well, there were national concerns that affected Hudson people. A war with the British and their Indian allies seemed imminent. There was a British Navy and warring Shawnee Indians in the area of Detroit, and the only thing between Detroit and Eastern America was the Western Reserve. Well, the Indians were, were fairly peaceful around here, but then uh, as we got toward the year 1812, there was all kinds of trouble on the frontier just to the west of us in western Ohio. Indians were uh, stirring up problems on the frontier and they were allying themselves with the British across the boundary in what is now Canada. And people were afraid about what that alliance might be, what that might cause. The British were still licking their wounds from losing the colonies in the Revolutionary War. They still had designs on America and were forging alliances with the Shawnee Indians and their chief, Tecumseh. The catalyst for the War of 1812 had to do with American shipping of goods on the high seas. The British were seizing American ships and forcing the captured sailors to work on British ships. Ohio was the western front for the nation. To our north, Commodore Oliver Perry defeated the British in the Battle of Lake Erie, which stopped the expansion from Canada. In the west, Tecumseh was defeated at the Battle of Tippecanoe, and in the south, Andrew Jackson defeated a huge British force in New Orleans. Britain suffered over 2,000 casualties in that decisive battle, whereas Jackson lost only 71 men. The British were also fighting Napoleon in France. Finally, the British said enough is enough and signed a treaty in 1814. A great sigh of relief must have radiated throughout the Western Reserve. Wars were done and there were crops to plant and kids to raise and a town to build. This small community, isolated as it, as it seemed to be, was, uh, was succeeding in a way that other early communities did not. One of the reasons attributed to Hudson's early success was David Hudson's focus on education. In Europe, education was for privileged people. Education, economics, and freedom were great things if only you were privileged. But this was America. More importantly, this was Hudson. Owen Brown, for example, was a, a, a leather tanner in Connecticut. He had uh, served as an apprentice and he had grown into his own profession and become a, a true tanner when he was in Connecticut. And yet he never really had much of an education. He couldn't speak without stuttering. He stuttered his entire life. He was illiterate when he was in Connecticut. And yet, when he came from Connecticut to Ohio, he brought 13 books with him. He couldn't read those books, but he knew that those books would be important to his children. And so he caused each of his children to learn those books, and in some cases, memorize those books. And then much later in life, he learned to become literate himself. Our first school was literally centered on the grain. Um, there was a meeting house that served both as a church and a school. Ultimately, there became school districts in and around Hudson with a variety of one-room kind of buildings serving as schools. The children were sent to those schools when school was in session. They were very conversant um, about grammar, about mathematics, about astronomy, about music. Um, they had wonderful relationships with their teachers who they knew their entire life. The dream was to build a college in the Western Reserve, and David Hudson wanted it here, in Hudson. 
A college would attract families and businesses. A great college would attract great minds, and great minds do great things. Uh, very early, as early as 1801 or 2, a charter was sought from the territorial legislature for the purpose of founding a college that would serve the Connecticut Western Reserve. Well, it took a lot of years before that actually materialized, but in 1826, the Western Reserve College and its high school division, the preparatory school, were founded here in Hudson. The One of the young teachers at Western Reserve College, a Yale graduate named Elias Loomis, taught astronomy and math. He designed an observatory for the school and traveled to Europe to purchase the finest instruments for its completion. The Loomis Observatory opened in 1836 and is the second oldest in America. Think about this. Right here in Hudson, people could observe the stars and beyond. There are only a few places in the entire world where this was possible. After we became a nation, our population went from 5 million in 1800 to 23 million by 1850. We were a nation of farmers. If you knew how to farm and weren't afraid to work, you could start and raise a family. To live off the bounty of the earth was God's work. Farming meant total freedom to many people. Everybody was a farmer to some extent. Almost everybody had uh, at least a family cow Probably 80% of the people made their living farming, and uh, those that didn't dabbled in business. And uh, uh, I mean, he—I'm sure that David Hudson was a businessman uh, and sold land. And uh, but uh, they were all farmers. Some were livestock farmers. Some were crop farmers. Certainly, spelts, wheat, oats—very common. Um, uh, crops around here. It really isn't until much later that the soybean comes along. Um, squash, um, you know, they would harvest berries. Bilberries were very popular back then and ask me what a bilberry is and I'll tell you it's a cousin to the blueberry. And they had cherry trees where they went and climbed the cherry tree to get the cherry. Um, I think that fruit trees were very prevalent and as they still are today. Apple trees. Um, tomatoes are talked about a little back then too. In the South, cotton and tobacco farming was big business. In fact, it was the backbone of the Southern economy. The Northern economy was based more on industry. The news of the day was about slavery. To abolish slavery meant to abolish the Southern economy because it depended on slavery to operate. But how could a nation founded on Christian principles and values, calling itself the freest nation in the world, enslave other human beings? Two economies and two sets of values were going to collide. Who would have thought one of the sparks that ignited the Civil War grew up right here in Hudson? Hudson was really a hotbed of abolitionist sentiment in the 19th century, and it really started in the 1830s at the old college, at Western Reserve College, where there were a number of professors who were anti-slavery firebrands. The Brown family came to Hudson in 1805. Owen Brown had eight children. The fourth child, John, is written about in all our nation's history books. John grew up in this fervent discussion about slavery. He formed his opinion about it after listening to many different opinions. Yeah, there was a, an abolish, abolitionist preacher who came to town and gave a fine sermon. And at the end of that sermon, I stood up and I said that I, John Brown, in the presence of this company, do hereby commit my life to the abolition of slavery. John Brown was a passionate abolitionist. He envisioned a slave uprising that would wake up the power structure of the Union. 
he devised a plan to overtake a Union arsenal at Harper's Ferry, West Virginia. I, I felt once we could make the slave owners in Virginia feel insecure that this valuable property that they owned could not be guaranteed to be there in the morning, that we would have begun the end of slavery. He raided the federal arsenal in West Virginia. Um, he had plotted for several years ahead of time. He had visited the Springfield Arsenal in Massachusetts to see how it was protected and fortified. He had the financial backing of several Eastern merchants um, that had given him money that wanted to see slavery come to an end. He was trying to force the issue onto the national discussion table and he was trying to force us to take action. My plan was originally to start out with a, a select corps of 25 men, to post them in a line in the mountains about five miles apart. And then from time to time, we, those people would go down into the fields and encourage those blacks who were the bravest and most daring to flee and to come up into the mountains with us. Then those who wanted to stay and fight would stay with us and we would extend that line. It didn't work out that way. An army company was dispatched to the arsenal under the command of Robert E. Lee. They surrounded the arsenal, killed most of Brown's men, including his son, and they captured and wounded John Brown. A huge, very public trial ensued, where Brown was found guilty of treason, conspiracy, and murder, and hung six weeks later on December 2, 1859. The trial and hanging galvanized the nation. In the crowd, watching the hanging, was a man named John Wilkes Booth. Don't you wonder what he was thinking? Historians are still studying and researching as to the causes of the Civil War. Some say it was about preserving the Union. Most agree it was to end slavery. The North and South could not agree on any policy unless and until slavery was abolished. All it took was a spark. The Civil War was on. When it ended in April of 1865, over 620,000 died. The North lost 362,000, the South 258,000. Of the 179,000 Negro troops, 36,000 died. There were more casualties in this war than all the other wars our nation has been in combined. We had Hudsonites that served at every major battle in, in the war. We had them that served at Cold Harbor. We had them at Vicksburg. We had them at Shiloh. We had them at Gettysburg. Every battle that occurred um, that we know as major battles in the Civil War, there was a Hudsonite. Ohio raised over 320,000 men for the war, and over 35,000 were killed. The North had about 2.5 million men, the South about 1.5. When the battles occurred, the pivotal battles or the formidable battles that occurred in the Civil War, it was often heard back in Hudson within a day or two. For instance, there was a battle at Corinth, and a great number of Hudson's young men, our boys, were at Corinth, and it was well known the day after Corinth that we had a number of Hudsonites that had been injured and or killed at Corinth. And um, then it was a matter of weeks. The families would go to the battle sites and collect the bodies of their sons and bring them home on the train and bury them. Hello, family. It's Christmas, and we're in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. I sure wish I was back home in Hudson right about now. We've had a delicious turkey dinner with all the fixings. Our friends and relatives sitting around the fire swapping yarns. I must say, it's a tad different down here. I think we're going to have a rip-roaring fight down here in the next few days. 
the Army of the Cumberland, that'd be us, against the Army of Tennessee, and those are the Rebs. Their camp is across the river about five, six hundred yards away. It was funny. Our band was playing Yankee Doodle Dandy, and their band would strike up with Dixie. Our band would play something else, and their band would play something else. But some, then something quite odd happened. Both bands played Home Sweet Home at the very same time. And thousands of soldiers on both sides of the lines sang at the very same time. It really made me think of Hudson. Well, folks, time to get me some shut-eye. I've now made lieutenant, and I'm now responsible for over 100 men. There must be a lot of Rebs out there, because all we can see are campfires. If you see Alexa, please pay my respects. There's no place like home. The Civil War ended April 10th, 1865. Abraham Lincoln was assassinated four days later. The Union was saved and slavery was abolished. It was time to heal the nation. With emancipation came freedom. 3.5 million slaves were now, quote, free. But what did that mean? Free to go where? To do what? All wars bring about technological change. There was another revolution on the horizon something called an industrial revolution, where machines would do the work for men. Hudson, at its roots, has always been an agricultural community. And even when industrialization hits, it's the agricultural background that gets refined. We can make cheese in 1840, but in 1880, we can make a lot more cheese and ship it down the Mississippi to New Orleans because now we can make the box to put the cheese in, we can grow the cheese a little faster. Um, we had several cheese houses. We were cheese central, the cheesedom really of the world. Um, the, the mechanical processes in every industry were affected by the Industrial Re Revolution because technology sort of refines the job. Gus Grimm, Gustav Henry Grimm, is a German immigrant who settles here in the 1850s but he revolutionizes the maple syrup industry by tinkering with the process. He makes evaporators that are fluted and they can boil sap much quicker with a, a fluted pan and an evaporator than we could with an old copper kettle. The next generation after Lincoln was to produce no great statesman, few great novelists or poets of stature, and but two or three artists of world eminence. But it produced more business genius than any country in the history of the world. In 1860, the United States ranked fourth in the world in producing goods. By 1900, the United States outproduced every nation in the world and you could add the production of the next top three nations together and it still wasn't even close. This too brought about change in Hudson. Our location between Akron and Cleveland in an age when capitalism was king brought executives and businessmen and their families to Hudson. There was an entrepreneur in Hudson who also had big plans. James Ellsworth was born in 1849 here in Hudson. He was homeschooled, so to speak, educated at Western Reserve College and preparatory school. With diploma in hand and desire in his soul, he set out to conquer the world of business and made a fortune in coal mines and banking. He had homes in Hudson, Chicago, Switzerland, and Italy, but when it came time to retire, he chose Hudson. His mom was in Hudson his childhood friends and memories, but when he came back he found the town and college in disarray. He personally was going to restore Hudson to the beauty and design it was intended to be. I believed I owed Hudson something. Hudson gave me the foundation, 
the character and the success I needed for my business. People in Hudson wanted me to succeed, and that I did beyond my wildest dreams. But Hudson was hurting. Two fires, a failed bank, no utilities to speak of, and bars and saloons seemed to be everywhere. The people lost their sense of pride. It seemed like no one cared. I felt it my responsibility to bring back pride into this community. My friends would say, why are you doing this? Why are you spending all your time and all your money? And I would say, if not me, then who? We all had a responsibility to help each other. Yes, I made a lot of money, but I felt it more constructive to do something with it by giving back, and I chose Hudson, and I'd do it again. And so what he did was that he formulated a series of proposals that he brought to the Hudson Village Council in, in December of 1907, uh, and they were proposals that said, if you will work with me, I will be glad to provide Hudson with the kind of infrastructure that a growing village needs to have. So he would provide Hudson with uh, its water plant and sewers and the project to put all of that together. He would also provide Hudson with an electric power plant because there was no electricity that yet in Hudson. Uh, he also uh, you know, would work on improvement on the, uh, the roads of Hudson if the village would commit to that as well. And he wanted the village to uh, endorse a plan for tree planting because he wanted to see beautiful elm trees gracing his village, his native village. With the story about James Ellsworth is the story that we put our utilities underground in the downtown corridor in the late 1890s and early turn of the century. So you don't see utility lines in downtown Hudson as you do in most communities. Carolyn Baldwin Babcock made her mark in Hudson as much as any person in our history. Her gift to our Hudson history was her love of community, a seeker of knowledge, and a respect for those that came before. In 1910, she endowed the library with $100,000, and the library we have today came from the vision of a woman over a hundred years ago. Back in those days, people really relied on each other. Your word was your bond. You only had each other to depend on. What if you needed tools for blacksmithing, a plow, a blanket, seeds for planting? Maybe you wanted to buy some land to farm. Where might you go to get the money? We didn't have a national bank. We didn't even have a national currency. How would you get the credit to get something if there was no money around? Here in Hudson, we had uh, one prominent individual Charles Buss that was well known throughout the community for loaning money. If you needed money to start a business or to buy a farm, um, you could go to C.H. Buss and he would write a note with you and you would pay him over time for the money you borrowed. The community really depended upon itself and the community helped itself. Things like character and honor and, and morality had a great deal of meaning to these people. So when you gave a man your word, it meant something. By the start of the 20th century, America's economy was in full swing. Our country was only 124 years old, and already it was leading the world in opportunities for freedom and wealth. Don't think the rest of the world didn't take notice. Between 1900 and 1913, over 13 million people from impoverished countries in Europe and elsewhere came to our shores looking to start a new and better life. Hudson wouldn't have wonderful Fourth of Julys without immigration. We are home to the American Fireworks Company and um, fireworks was quite the industry here in Hudson, Ohio. And uh, the people that started that business, one of the families that started that business, happened to be Italian immigrants that came to our community in those time periods. 
The immigrants didn't find the streets paved with gold or any easy answers. Everyone here wasn't rich. But here in this country, everyone had a chance if they were willing to learn and work hard. This huge influx of people didn't directly affect Hudson. Most settled in the big industrial cities looking for factory jobs. Nearby Cleveland, Akron, Canton, and Youngstown had plenty of them. There was no book about how a nation absorbs 13 million immigrants. How to house, feed, and employ them created good and bad things. There was no book about how to build a car company and how to manufacture and sell cars all over the world. No books on the oil or tire business either. Common people created those industries. Never before in the history of the world did common men influence the quality of life for the entire world. Lots of people loved their new country, but the peace and prosperity wasn't going to last long. Something new and most sinister was about to prevail over the entire world. A world war. World War I was to be the war to end all wars. Our sergeant sounded the alarm. It's the gas, lads, the gas. Down your mask quickly. A yellowish-greenish cloud plumed from the shells from the German lines. A ghastly sight. A company man on our right was slow to put on his mask and we watched in horror as he sunk to the ground, clenching his throat. After a few spasmatic twitches, he went west. We were powerless to help him. We had to shoot our horses because we didn't want them to suffer. In a corner of our trench, our little muddy company dog was laying dead with his paws over his nose. David Lee The World War ended and peace and prosperity came home and abroad. Hudson had a very interesting party on the green um, after the signing of some of the treaties in Europe. And we awarded medals to every veteran that had served in World War I. The community awarded medals. And on the back of the, is their name. And on the front, there was the thanks of Hudson, Ohio for the, your service in World War I. The 1920s were considered a fun decade, maybe a little too much fun. Who would have thought that by the end of 1929, the world would be in the worst depression in history? While the world was fighting its way out of the depression, Hudson explorer Lincoln Ellsworth was fighting other odds. He was exploring Antarctica in the 1930s. And if you look at Antarctica, you will see there's an Ellsworth mountain range and there are peaks named for his wife, his mother, and his father. He traversed both the North and South Pole multiple times by different modes of transportation each time. He is the only Hudsonite to have the distinction of being on a U.S. postal stamp. And he is the reason that we are called, as a school system, the Hudson Explorers. Europe during this time was a powder keg. Adolf Hitler and the German Empire had designs on making a new Germany and a new Europe. The Japanese Empire also had the same designs. When dictators want something, they usually don't ask. They take. Germany invaded Poland, Austria, and France and attacked England. Japan attacked our own Pearl Harbor. After Pearl Harbor, millions of men and women joined the armed forces in the next few days. Hudson people would carry their own weight in this next world war. We had so many people that we had educated, young men that had gone through Western Reserve Academy and, and been raised up and knew that they were going off to fight in all theaters of the war. but the headmaster, the newspaper editor, especially assigned young ladies in the community, all of which kept regular correspondence with all the young men from Hudson that served. Hello family, I'm a long way from Hudson on an island called Malta in the Mediterranean. 
It's too bad I'm in the middle of this war. This island is beautiful. The Germans and Italians want Malta because it's in the perfect location for staging operations in North Africa. General Rommel said they lose Malta, they lose North Africa. I have been ordered to fly for the Royal Air Force. We have to keep this island for the Allies. They say we're supposed to get the new Spitfires here any day. Can't wait to fly one of those babies. Our job is to defend the island and disrupt enemy shipping. I know you're worried about me, and sometimes I'm worried about me too. It won't be long. We're winning this thing, and I'll be home soon. Hudson contributes in many ways, both with young men, but young women too. We had rations, just like everybody else, you know, sugar rations, tire rations. Um, we grew more Victory Gardens during the 40s than most people. The flood company is well known for developing a line of paint, and that paint was used on many of the naval destroyers. Many of the women of this community go to Akron and Cleveland and work as Rosie the Riveter in the tank factories or down to Akron and build the, the wonderful airplanes they built in Akron um, or work in the rubber uh, industries to provide rubber for tires. So I would tell you that Hudson was very patriotic during the war. One of the greatest contributions to the war effort came from John Morse who became one of our nation's great inventors. He became a beacon of light in two industries in America, and it started in his garage right here in Hudson. Without John Morse and Morse Industries, we would have never had nighttime camera photography that enabled our American bombers to sight and bomb specific locations within Germany. John Morse is, has a letter from um, one of the major generals of the World War II congratulating him and saying, without nighttime photography, we could have never won the war. John had a great mechanical mind. He liked to look at things and see if he could improve their design and use. After the war, John developed the throttle and shift controls for boats and outboard motors. It was a single lever, all mechanical engine control. It was to boats what the automatic transmission was to cars. From the humble start in his garage, he employed hundreds of local people and became part of a billion dollar company just from looking at things and trying to make them better. The war's end changed the world. There was a population explosion called the baby boomers and our economy was in high gear. We wanted our own homes, a nice car, and we wanted to watch color television. Whatever we wanted, someone made, if not here in America, somewhere in the world. Our nation's colleges filled, and the end result became even more technological innovation. We built the machines that would build a better world. The Terex Corporation from here in Hudson built machines that literally could move mountains. A lot of new families came to Hudson with the Terex plant. The ones who had lived closer to Cleveland now wanted to be in Hudson where they could have a home, a, what was a fine school system even then, and be close to their place of business. So, Terex was a tremendous generator of interest in living in Hudson. Hudson's population grew slowly but steadily from 1950 on. People liked what they saw in the community. It felt like home to them, no matter where they came from. City planners long ago wanted to keep Hudson like Hudson. Well, I think people came to Hudson because they, they liked what they saw here. They saw a beautiful central village that was maintained. They saw the possibilities of 
nice neighborhoods developing both in the village and also out in what was then Hudson Township. There was a chance to buy larger properties, uh, such as those along Valley View Road and Hines Hill Road, which tended to be larger, maybe even horse farm type properties. So people were attracted by what the community already was and, but, and about what it could become. There's more diversity in this town of 25 square miles than in most of the surrounding Northeast Ohio area. And I think it goes back to David Hudson and some of the other uh, people who are of such prominence. For over 200 years, Hudson has developed and attracted great people. In the early 1970s, Tom Murdo moved his family here after setting up shop in a barn. He was a college graduate, a former captain in the Marines, and he was an entrepreneur. He got very fascinated with uh, the process of rotational molding. Ended up picking up a job, uh, uh, a contract for 100,000 personal stay bedpans, and figured out uh, in a period of about three months how to mold these bedpans with, uh, and, and went through got with mold makers and uh, material suppliers and other people and I learned more about this process called rotational molding in about six months time uh, than I learned ever since. Within 10 years, what he started in that old barn would become Little Tykes, employing over 1,700 people. But I got fascinated with the toy industry and the speed at which it moved, how competitive it was, very exciting. And I saw an opportunity with this process to do something different. We took a process that was out of favor and figured out how to make it work. And we became the largest rotational molding company in the world. People that travel and shop in Hudson today admire the diversity of our civic buildings, homes, and their architecture. This too is because of planning. In 1963, the city of Hudson established an architectural review board. And what the architectural review board wanted was some variety. It didn't want exact replicas of houses lined up on streets that looked exactly alike. And there was a sort of look anti-look-alike clause uh, that the architectural review board enacted in the mid-60s. So it's important, and I think that's the most important thing that the kids in school can learn, is that some things are worth fighting to keep. Most of our downtown now is on the National Register, and in fact, downtown Hudson was one of the first historic districts in the state of Ohio. There's a lot going on here that, in the context of our state, is really important, and I think you know, I guess kind of selfishly, that nationally what's going on in Hudson is of amazing importance because we've worked hard to keep a downtown core that's viable. Our founding fathers created a nation that enabled what a David Hudson could do. America is all about foundations, and the basic foundation of all was freedom for the common man. David Hudson understood this freedom. It's important for the young people to understand that there is a foundation from which uh, this community has, raised, has been raised and in which they are being raised and that while we're embracing uh, the new modern societies and technologies and all of that, you still have this wonderful strong foundation of the past in which to provide you uh, f uh, the view of the future. David Hudson did it. From a population of zero to over 24,000 people, a beautiful community with exactly the diversity of people our founders had in mind. Our country was made to challenge people to become and create 
what they want to be. No other nation in the history of the world was ever created for that purpose. We became a great nation and Hudson a great community because individuals educated and challenged themselves and then gave back to Hudson in so many ways. Uh, there's the old adage, it takes a community to raise a child, and Hudson has taken that to heart. The community in total was uh, uh, highly involved in providing the organizations, uh, that provided activities for them, uh, providing learning experience for them. Uh, individuals volunteered within their school systems or on, on uh, different athletic teams. Uh, that the um, uh, citizens provided uh, support of their, of their community uh, by which they grew. David Hudson challenged himself with his bare hands, basic tools, and a belief in his abilities. John Brown challenged himself and our nation to end slavery. James Ellsworth developed and owned coal mines to feed our nation's industries. His son explored Antarctica. C.B. Bus created a store stocked with necessities and lent people money to start a life. David Hudson built a college that has created governors, industrialists, authors, poets, doctors, and diplomats. John Morse tinkered in his garage and helped the United States win World War II. Lieutenant Hitchcock and Captain Two gave their lives for their beliefs in freedom, and they came from wealthy backgrounds. Tom Murdo educated himself after a college education in his garage to create a worldwide business. Perseverance. Uh, there were plenty of times it would have been easier to give up and just uh, take another route. But when you're, when you're committed and you persevere and you have a vision and you give yourself a chance and you have faith in yourself and your idea, um, you can make it happen. You can do it today. Uh, the beauty of America is that uh, in this country, anybody, can do it if they work at it. And therein lies the secret to success. Challenge yourself to learn on your own, whether it's going to college, serving as an apprentice, or go in your own garage and tinker. That's the gift of this nation. It's also the gift of Hudson. And I do firmly believe that when our young people go off uh, to seek their lives, they go off with a foundation that I wish all children had. I really, really do. Uh, but I know that our children have that, and it gives them a strength to endure uh, the hardships that we all face at one time or another and to uh, overcome. And I, I think that's a tremendous message. David Hudson did it. He wanted to create a beacon of light in the wilderness by designing a community where people could raise a family, start a business, educate themselves, and contribute to the community and this great nation. Hudson today has about 24,000 people, an upscale community rated as one of the best places to live in America. We have a highly educated workforce, and 97% of our students attend four-year colleges. There are currently almost 5,000 students in grades K through 12, and Hudson schools rank in the top 2% of all Ohio districts. Within short driving distance are 24 colleges and universities leading the world in bioscience, polymers, liquid crystals, and industrial research. Hudson is home to 900 diverse small businesses and national headquarters. We have 20 parks, public and private golf courses, over 90 retail and specialty shops, and restaurants with cuisine from all over the world. One look at the Hudson Library speaks volumes of our community. Learning and independent study are the foundations that continue today. This gift is now yours. 
Hudson has all the resources you need to challenge yourself and create opportunity. There is a history here of common people doing great things. If they can do great things, you can too.